questions about life, universe, or anything, we'll just present it to the panel and see what we can come up with. My question is to say, in the past and future, are there any female Buddhas in these scriptures? Ah, female Buddhas. Well, that's a kind of interesting one, because as I mentioned in the... No, well, the question, the simple answer is no. Uh, certainly not in the mainstream scriptures. Uh, of course, I mentioned that the Buddha said that, the time, that, that, that women have the same spiritual capacity in terms of being enlightened. Now, so basic question in Buddhism is that there's a distinction between that, say, enlightenment, which is actually like purity of heart, okay, which is all becoming an arahant, and then becoming a Buddha, the basic difference is that becoming a Buddha means also that you have um, like a special gift for, for teaching and sharing that teaching, yeah? sharing that Dhamma. Now, there's, there's one passage which is, I don't think is an authentic passage, and uh, because one of the things the Buddha said is that well, basically everything that I teach is both true and useful. And I don't think it's authentic because it's probably neither true nor useful. <laughs> but the, he goes through different kind of classes of beings and says that, for example, a, a, a woman can never be Brahma, the great the king of the gods. She can never be uh, Indra, the king of gods. He can, a woman can never be Mara, which is kind of a dubious <laughs> distinction, Mara being the, the tempter, the, the devil. Right? <laughs> so not quite a bit ambiguous that particular one. And then in the same passage says that, that a woman can never be a Buddha. Okay? Now I don't think the whole passage sounds very plausible, but if you were to if you were trying to, to try to interpret it rationally, what would you interpret it as saying? Well one of the other things that it says is that a Buddha must all in the same passage Buddha must always be either a Kshatriya or a Brahmana. Okay? So they're born either in one of the two highest castes mm -hmm. in Indian class society. And according to Buddhist texts is that sometimes the Kshatriya were regarded as the highest caste and sometimes the Brahmins were regarded as the highest caste. So whichever the highest caste at that time was, it would be the Buddha. Now, the Buddhist scriptures elsewhere acknowledge that the Yonas, of course is those from uh, Ionia, the Greeks, uh, have only two castes. They only have the free men and the slaves. Okay, so th that th that system doesn't apply everywhere. But nevertheless, the Buddha has to come from the highest caste. Now we know that the Buddha was not into the caste system. I mean, that's very basic. This is really one of the basic mm -hmm. things that the Buddha did was reject the caste system. So why is this thing? In there. Well, the only way I can make sense of that, if you want to try to rationalize it, maybe you don't want to try to rationalize it, but if you want to try to rationalize it, you'd say that the status of being a Buddha means you have to be a world teacher. So that means you have to be in a position which in that culture and in that time would be respected and in a position of authority and regarded as being in a position of authority by everybody because otherwise you couldn't bring your, your, your message universally. And so if he came from a low caste, then there may be people from high caste who would reject his teaching from that regard. Maybe if he was born as a woman in that kind of culture, there would be people who would reject his teaching because he's a woman. Okay? So that might be simply to say that, you know, to paraphrase that, what it's actually saying is you would have to come from a, uh, a, a situation or a class where, where you're regarded <coughs> as uh, from the, the, like the more respected Uh, amazingly uh, unproblematic the vast majority of the time uh, but sometimes of course they are problematic but one That is, that is right is the one that is valuable in the present. Yeah? And uh, even though there may be many teachings available, 
but, but, but of course they're teaching that the Buddha gave in a time or a place, or that was passed down by the tradition, whether the Buddha himself said it or not, in a time and place for a particular circumstance, and that may be not our circumstance. Yeah? And so that one which is uh, right is the one that's right for us. And uh, we were talking a little bit about that earlier, but the, the one of the things that I've noticed in, in, in my tradition is that often what's in the scripture is actually the opposite of what's happening in reality. And that's why it's in the scripture. Right? And it's a bit like that, that, that thing I mentioned before about if there's a rule for something, that means people were transgressing the rule. Yeah? So, for example, I've noticed that very much in Thailand, the Thai forest tradition, if you read the books from the Thai forest tradition, it's really kind of tough guy stuff, some of it. You know, Ajahn Mahabu is a kickboxer. He's like jump into the ring, smash the defilements, get them down to the ground, throttle them, kick them. You know, and and uh, it's all this kind of very very kind of full on language, yeah. And you think, God, these guys must be really out there, you know. And you know, it's really kind of intense. And when you go to the forest monasteries, the monks are so relaxed, they're just you know, happy, and, and you know, it's quite amazing. And of course, that's why those teachings are given because you've got to give them a bit of a kick to get them to go and do some meditation. Yeah? So there's no point in telling those monks, you know, be relaxed, be happy, don't get, you know, don't, don't make your life complicated, be simple, because they're already doing those things. <laughs> what you need to do is to make sure, get out of bed in the morning, yeah? Do some meditation, yeah? And uh, so that's what's been given. So always to remember that, that what's been given is a corrective to what's going wrong. It's not made as an absolute. I think also you... No religion takes place in the absence of the culture around it, of course. Um, and somehow you've got to find a way of adjusting to it. Uh, and the early Quakers said quite clearly that the women are equal, uh, that there was no theoretical problem. But the women were in many ways not equally skilled. Um, not as many of them were literate, because that was the culture they were in. Not as many had administrative experience. Um, not as many had managed large sums of money. So if you want them to actually take an equal place, you've got to have some sort of period of education before they can do it. And apart from setting up schools for girls, one of the things they did was to actually have some separate meetings and give the women some particular jobs. And so they'd say the women are, they usually got the welfare type jobs. <laughs> But at least they were given some individual responsibility, so they developed skills in administration and developed skills in handling money. You, you know, you can't just say to the women, be equal. Um, you, you have to deal with the things that have made the money equal. Yeah. And I should, and I, I should, should make, the, make the point that, that, that within Buddhism, those things happen as well. say, for example, that a monk shouldn't get a nun to wash his robes for him. Mm. Okay? Now, of course, that's telling you what was actually going on in the monastery. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite telling. Yeah? And uh, so there has to be a rule to say, no, 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 no. The nuns are not there to be the domestic servants for all the monks. Yeah? Mm. And uh, so there's those things of protection as well. Yeah. I guess women are maybe portrayed as um, some kind of relationship to men. So in that case, it was a marriage. Um, you know, is there very many things that portray an individual consciousness? Um, before, just I said something. I just remembered about women in the Gathas. Uh, Zarathustra talks to her daughter and said that uh, um, after this is the marriage uh, a ceremony, and uh, he suggests that you should now you are entering the adulthood and you have responsibilities so you should be a member of the uh, adulthood uh, association or the community um, uh, set up and uh, you have to compete with your husband there is only one competition in his song and you have to be better you have both of you you have uh, to compete with each other 
in the path of righteousness or asha. And if for any reason you be denounced yourself or you be denounced by others from this society, it is alas, alas, it's very sad. So women, they have actually a role in the uh, society and community very strongly, as I told you, as the first teacher and uh, the ones that develop uh, everything in their children, raise up their children. But um, uh, it was very interesting, I thought just now, um, uh, though Iran, it's about uh, 1,400 years, Islam has invaded Iran, and everyone knows <coughs> about the rights of women in Iran, but before this, even before this revolution, we had, uh, the women had m rights to vote before American got the right to vote, much before Australia they had the right to vote. And women uh, were in parliament, as I told you. Women uh, were uh, teaching at universities. And uh, amazingly, even today, um, there are um, in many uh, faculties, uh, such as dentistry, more than 65% of the uh, students are girls, are women. Um, if you look at the whole outlay of <coughs> Islam, though people you know, in uh, um, Iran, majority, big majority, because the minorities are less than 5% uh, in, uh, in Iran, the women, they think they have the right, to, uh, and there are riots about this covering everything else, but except this covering head, they have the, their own rights, they kept their own rights even during this revolution, because they think they are from, uh, they, uh, they have their, their choice and freedom of choice, equality from the past. They know they are in Muslim, but they think they are Iranians. They go with the rights of women in the society today. It's very, very uh, important that you know, even um, in, uh, uh, now that they are outside of Iran, um, they have uh, become uh, members of parliament in many other countries, and so it is achievable for women to have all sorts of things. We have business women here, even doing trade with Iran, but there are many Iran, uh, women that they are doing. Everything is achievable with women, and they are very persistent. And of course, you know, Clinton, the Hillary Clinton is very persistent, <laughs> but Iranian women are very persistent. So they kept their own right and their own the Islamic law as well. This is very important. It's interesting you should bring that up because we've been discussing um, the relationship between culture and religion in the sense that culture has been, in a way, corrupting religion. Mm -hmm. But what you bring up there is the extent in which religion affects culture and subsists under that culture, is, or perhaps I'm misinterpreting. No, that, that's very correct, that's what I want to say. Uh, you, if you can't have any contact with Iranian, especially girls and women, you see what is their feeling. They feel that they have that right. They feel that they are equal. So can I, can I exercise it in Iran at the moment? No, not when it comes into the law. Why not when it comes into the family law now that it has changed during the 30 years? Uh, the, during the revolution, but before that, we didn't have we didn't have um, polygamy. We didn't have uh, three wives, two wives, or anything like that. Though it was an Islamic, we didn't have Sharia law, uh, law in Iran um, and uh, many other things. And uh, the mothers they had the right over children, but uh, this in this uh, system now they don't have the right. the men and women have equal access to it, but if you ask me what is the ideal, that is the hard thing. I, I, I couldn't tell you what is the ideal for your life. I mean, everyone must seek through the divine light to find what is their way of living. And we're very nervous about telling each other what is the way in which they must live but everybody is equally capable of finding 
what is right for them. To what extent are you, are you first of all aware of what sex they are, and to what extent are you just aware that they are themselves? And I should think that ideally, you, you see people first and foremost as themselves. You know, what we said, every person is unique and precious and a child of God. Well, their uniqueness may be more important than their sex. Depends how good looking they are. Thank you very much, everybody coming tonight. Um, it is certainly a very cold night out there, and Well Park is certainly not easy to get to. But I think it's been a very, very worthwhile night. I'd like to thank our speakers, in particular our guests. So, everybody, would like to give our guests a round of applause.